uh, and Sister Shana Dutka send greetings. They're, are they in Italy now? France. They're in France right now. Right. And most of all, also, I want to bring love from the rest of our family. Uh, Rachel on the left, Aaron on the right, they said, please, please give our love to everybody there. I think those of you in Orlando know Aaron kind of popped in here last June uh, as a surprise, but he said, please uh, give my love, special love to the brethren there. And Rachel had intended to come with us. Uh, we were going to, tomorrow's her birthday, and we were going to spend a few days in Disney World. <laughs> 45 years old, she wants to go to Disney World. But, hey, so do the sports guys, what can I say? But uh, she has to work, so she was unable to get off. But she said, please give my greetings to the brethren there. So, and we are especially happy to be here with the brethren in Orlando. Very special place. This talk comes from my wonderment at a scripture that's bothered me for, I don't know, 30 years at least. It's this scripture in Ezekiel 38, 11. Of course, Ezekiel 38, we realize, is part of the end time prophecy about uh, Gog and Magog descending upon Israel in the last days. Right in the middle of that prophecy is this statement made in, in verse 11. Uh, I, it says, Thou shalt say, I will go to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. And I just could never figure out what does that mean when we look at Israel today, how could they ever be in this? So that's what I want to answer in this talk, but you're not going to find out my answer until the end. So make sure you don't fall asleep for the conclusion. But we've got to build a case to get to here. And that's really what I want to do at this point. First, why Israel? That's a question. There's a lot of noise in the world today, okay? political noise especially. And it's covering, if you're not careful, get caught up in it. It masks what's really going on in the world from a prophetic and uh, scriptural standpoint. So, so many are very tempted to get involved with that. But think about, I want to dwell beyond that, the headlines that we see that the Lord is working out some very significant things as this goes on. First, let's answer the question, why Israel? Because this comes up a lot. Why is it that God favors Israel? Genesis 12, 3, I think, gives us a simple answer. This is the altar, Robert Alter translation, which is from the original Hebrew uh, of the Old Testament. And he translates this about Abraham. When he gives a promise to Abram, at this point, his name is not yet Abraham. He says, I will bless those who bless you. And the wording says, and those who damn you, I will curse. Now, we're used to saying curse and curse, but that's what really what the word is. And all the clans of the earth through you shall be blessed. Here's the Hebrew words. This word, first word that's used, those who curse you, as we have in King James, but it's really those who damn you, comes from a root that literally means to make light of something heavy. In other words, you take something and say, oh, it's nothing. And the curse actually comes, it's a completely different word that means to utterly destroy. So notice what God says, those who make light of you, I will utterly destroy them. That's the ultimate goal, that those who make light of Israel and Abraham's promises will be taken off the scene. That's the ultimate goal that God has. When we come to the decision about why is Israel favored, we have again, remember the promise made to Abraham, and God tells him after the birth of Ishmael through Hagar, his handmaiden, God says, no, Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son. You shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. Isaac was that child of promise, and God's message to Abraham about his favor uh, went through his son Isaac. That's, again, why is it that Israel is favored? God never forsook that covenant. In Leviticus 26, 44, we read, in spite of all they were doing when they are in the land of their enemies, in other words, they're not in Israel, they're captured, they're elsewhere, 
I will not reject them, nor will I so abhor them as to destroy them. God promised to preserve them, breaking my covenant with them. Not breaking that covenant because, why? Because I am the Lord, I am Yahweh, their God. Psalms 89 gives us some good answers, and this is just a partial quote from there. But this is what he says. If my sons forsake my law, do not walk in my judgments, which Israel did not. If they violate my statutes and do not keep my commandments, which they did not, then I will punish their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. But, but I will not break off my loving kindness from him, nor deal falsely in my faithfulness. My covenant I will not violate nor will I alter the utterance of my lips. So there's the promise, solidified. Despite what they do, because of my promise to Abraham, that's going to be good for eternity, for the ages of ages. When we get to the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, remember this is a time when Jews and Gentiles are coming together in the newly formed Christian community. And James makes a statement in, in uh, Acts 15, when we have this council, that the Jews were not cast off. He says, I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down. They were being cast off. I will build again the ruins, set them up. That, why? So the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called. It would be that blessing that would happen. James is quoting from Amos 9, a promise to Israel. James must, in giving this prophecy, must have understood about the destruction and restoration of Israel. So that's the question, why Israel? It's all hinged on the promise God made to Abraham, and God always keeps his word. But that conflict between Isaac and Ishmael went on for many years. Uh, Ishmael, remember we read in Genesis 25, Ishmael went to Paran. And we read there about his descendants, those that were found in the land when they came out of Egypt. The Midianites, the Edomites, the Egyptians, the Assyrian. Now the tradition of Islam says that they settled in Mecca, and that's why Mecca is the most holy place in the nation of Islam. But Genesis 16, 12 says that he really became then the leader of all the desert people, the nomads that we see, that were encountered. And the first conflict we have was back in Numbers 20. Moses brought the people out of the land of Egypt, and the occupants we read in the land, you can read them here, were all those that were these descendants. Moses sends in messengers, says, let us pass through, we're not going to hurt you. We've got a common ancestor. We're related. And they said, sorry, can't go. And they didn't go at that point. Later, we know that they came back and fought their way through. But that became a perpetual nuisance to Israel, even to this day. So when we think about this conflict, it started back in Numbers 20. Today, we look at Israel and the Arab world. Now, if you're an Israelite in this Arab world, what are you thinking? Well, that little red dot that you see there, that little blue and red dot, that's Israel. So you say, wow, I'm surrounded by my enemies. And that's true. That's exactly where they are. They have been. They're surrounded today. Back in 1945, following World War II, the Arab League was formed. And there were six founding members in that Arab League. Remember now, World War II is over. The Jews have been driven out. The Jews have been killed, six million of them murdered. The Jews are now trying to find a way, and they're starting to move into their, into, back into Canaan, much like what Moses wanted to pass through, but they wouldn't let him. Six founding members of that Arab League were Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, and Syria. Now, there were a lot of others. I don't have time to cover everybody, but I think these are important keys because ever since the beginning in 1948, when Israel was founded and declared statehood, 
it was these countries that really led most of the trouble that they had. That Arab world that expanded over time was really led, and those nations were the ones that tried to prevent Israel from being able to be established in that homeland. Let's jump forward. 2011, you may recall the bound was the Arab Spring was founded. The Arab Spring came as many anti-government protests, uprising, armed rebellions across the whole Middle East. It followed much of the revolution that we had from the 89 onward in Eastern Europe. Some of you I know perhaps personally experienced some of that from 89 onward, and it kind of moved out, and this was the last big wave. The, the Arab Spring was meant to sort of free these uh, dictatorships that were there, uh, rigged elections, all the things that were going on there. There's anger uh, mounting up, the brutality of security systems, rising prices, corruption was all over, and the state assets in some countries were privatized and owned by the government. So there was a huge uprising across the Middle East. And you can see, this is a map of how it sprung across. But it started in Tunisia, remember, with a priest burnt, setting himself on fire. And it went all the way down to Cairo. And what was the hope? The Arabs were looking to bring democratic reforms to those countries in the Middle East. And it looked like the Middle East was going to be changed forever. The old order looked like it was doomed. But what happened? Things fell apart very, very quickly. The states collapsed rather than being democratic. Civil war broke out across many of those countries. Some regained control. Seven years later, here we are in 2018, the Middle East now is more of a muddle than it was in 2011. Nothing really changed. If anything, it was more focused on dictatorships and on those issues. Let's take a look at some of the things that came out of there. But Israel, during this time, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, Prime Minister of Israel, said Israel remained an isle of stability during this whole seven year period. But notice what he said, everything is shaking. Later I'm gonna talk about what Israel has had to do as a result of what we've seen happen in the Arab Spring. It takes us closer to our prophetic understanding of what we expect towards the end of this age. So from, an, from a perspective of Israel, the Arab Spring is seen as a potential threat. We've had great volatility increase across the Middle East, rise of political Islam, worrisome trends for a nation like Israel trying to find its, keep its place in this small area of the Middle East. So the new order that was created across this Arab world really was not what was expected. The traditional great powers, we can go through them, but they, those were places like Egypt, Iraq was one of the great powers, Syria, great power. Those places today are barely functional as a result of this. The wealthy, repressive regimes, places like Qatar, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, they have great planes, by the way, if you ever get a chance to fly on United Arab Emirates flights, they're really nice. Uh, they're thriving because of the wealth that's been created, but they're still amongst the most corrupt groups in that area. That was not what was expected in the Arab Spring. It wasn't a democratic power, but now power is, is operating through influence peddling and proxy warfare. Saudi Arabia, now all of you undoubtedly have, been, have heard what's been happening recently in Saudi Arabia with the journalist killed who had worked, uh, he was actually worked for the Washington Post even though he was Saudi, but now the Saudis have admitted there was premeditated murder but it shows you the kind of corruption that's taken place in these places and the peddling of influence, the warfare that's going on. You know, Saudi Arabia is a great place to invest and those of us uh, companies that invested there, the investors, a lot of money, 
being invested across the world, but yet we have an extremely corrupt situation. I'm not going to talk a lot about Saudi Arabia, but keep your eye on Saudi Arabia because it's one of the most closed societies in the world and a very volatile region. Uh, you hear the term Machiavellian, right? And many of you hear Nick. Niccolo uh, Machiavelli was an Italian diplomat during the Renaissance period. And he had a, a lot of things to say, and you'll hear that quote, oh, that's a Machiavellian idea. Anyways, he had a quote that I think fits well in what's happening today in the Middle East. It says, it is better to be feared than loved if you cannot be both. And that's what we see across many of these countries. And I think that's the position we see even in Israel today. No one loves Israel, least of all its neighbors. And so what do you try to establish? The fear that has to be established during that time. Remember our theme text that I told you I wanted to come back because that scripture we have in Ezekiel 38.11 is certainly not one of fear. It's one when there is no fear of challenging a nation like Israel. Well, let's take a brief survey around those six countries that I mentioned as part of the Arab League. What's happened to them after the Arab Spring that started in 2011? We know in Syria, these are Israel's immediate neighbors, the ones that invaded them in 48 uh, after they became a nation. Syria. The Syrian civil war has been one of the greatest catastrophes in human history. We got over 500,000 civilians dead, over 10 million civilians displaced from their homes. 13 million people now need assistance. And you'll see the numbers on the nation of Syria, but it's been a real tragedy. And we know that problems are still going on there. Egypt, one of the other countries that was formed the Arab League. E Egypt is still suffering the consequences of their 2013 attempt in the Arab Spring when a military coup arose and al-Sisi, now uh, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, who's now in power, rose out of the military repression. But today, Egypt is in a dire straits. That repression has affected their tourism. Insurgency is rampant across. And there's been no real solutions offered to uh, eliminate some of that repression that was in Egypt beyond a squashing political uh, dissension. We move to Iraq. Of course, Iraq, we had the ISIS, the war with ISIS gone many years. Many thought that was going to be the way the end would come that group. But Iraq actually uh, has been defeating ISIS. ISIS is now in a predicament. But it's cost them greatly. And those that were in the liberated area, the corruption across Iraq is enormous. They have a deficit today of 13 trillion dinars. You may remember when this whole thing started back in 2011 and Iraq uh, was invaded and uh, people speculated, invested in the Iraqi dinar. I had a friend that uh, she put $10,000 into the Iraqi dinar. Oh, when it comes back, the country's problems are done. You know, we're going to be a millionaires. Well, guess what? I, you know, write off anything you invested there because you can see what that's worth on the U.S. dollar today, uh, 0. 0.00084 on a dollar. So. Iraq has been a tragedy, and we can look at many things, which we don't have time for, but all those things have really relegated Iraq to a really disheveled country. Then Jordan, to the east of Israel. Jordan is grappling with huge problems. Uh, they've got a great big discontented youth, and you can see here their unemployment stands at 18% a year. Now think about the U.S. unemployment is about is three is under 4%. So think about 18% unemployment, greatly among the youth. Well, when you've got youth that can't get a job, what happens? They rebel. 
And The Economist magazine ranked Amman, which is the capital city there, uh, the most expensive city in the Arab world. The average wage, however, is about five, the equivalent of $5,000 a year. So you can see the terrible straits that's happened uh, with Jordan. And finally, in Lebanon. Lebanon, just to the north, and the place, the home of Hezbollah, who has been one of Israel's big enemies. Uh, the Syrian civil war cost them greatly because thousands of those fighters went into Syria to fight and they were either killed or wounded. Now they're slowly moving back up into Lebanon. But Iran was a big supporter of Lebanon and they have cut that support budget. So Lebanon is struggling. They've had an interesting political environment there. This is the current president is uh, Michael Name Aoun, and he's a Maronite Christian. Now, many of you may have not have heard of the Maronite Christians. Let me tell you about the Maronite Christians because it makes a very interesting scenario as it relates to Israel and the Jewish people. The Maronite Christians were founded in the fourth century by a monk, duh, named Maron. Okay? Uh, that was about 410 AD. Now, Maron was a contemporary and a friend of John Chrysostom. You may recognize that name, John Chrysostom. He was very instrumental in transforming early Christianity into the corruption it is. He was the Bishop of Antioch in 387. Notice what he says here. He, wrote a, uh, he gave eight sermons against the Jews. And here's what he said about the Jews. The synagogue is not only a brothel and a theater, it is also a den of robbers and a lodging for wild beasts. No Jew adores God. Jews are inveterate murderers possessed by the devil. Their debauchery and drunkenness gives them the manners of a pig. Jews are abandoned by God and for the crime of deicide, there is no expiation possible. He, he crowned that term deicide. What does that mean? It's the Latin word that means God killer. That was the first time they pronounced it, that the Jews were guilty of the blood of God. He believed certainly in the Trinity at that point. And so that was the inauguration of that term, God killers. And from that point on, the Jews were in, under great disfavor in the Christian church. So that was the friend. And here we have the Maronite Christians that are in Lebanon now descended from that and the leader. So where does all this leave us? That's kind of a rapid movement through what's happened. Where does all this leave us? I think there's two simple truths that existed before the Arab Spring still exist today. The first truth, if the Arab nations laid down their weapons, there would be no more war in the Middle East. But the second truth, if Israel laid down its weapons, there would be no more Israel. We can't have at this point the fulfillment of that scripture, the land of unwalled villages, because Israel has to defend itself from its neighbors still, as they always have. So let's progress from there. Israel, by all standards, has an untenable position in the Middle East. When you look at that little red spot amidst all that green, you say to yourself, how in the world can that place stay where it is and as it is? Only one answer we can have. They are meant to be there, and God's promise to Abraham is keeping them there. But here's what's come out for Israel from the Arab Spring, uh, from Benjamin Netanyahu, now the leader, but here's some of the things that have come out. The very first time Israel's defense forces are implementing a four-dimensional strategy to battle because they expect fully that war with Hezbollah from Lebanon coming. The IDF now, the Israeli Defense Forces, practicing fighting in the underground. Cyber warfare, they are recruiting people and certainly those that have excellence in the whole world of cyber space uh, as part of that effort. 
they're practicing shooting for rooftops, high-rise building windows. They fully expect an invasion to take place. So let's migrate or move to what the scriptures say about this. Many of you know, and many of you may have studied, Psalm 83. I believe Psalm 83 describes a conflict that Israel has ongoing with the Arab nations. Because at the very beginning of this psalm, in verse 4, it says, Come, let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel be no more in remembrance. That started in 1948, when Israel became a nation. On that declaration, the next day, they're invaded by forces from the north, the south, and the east. So it was a huge effort from the very beginning, this ongoing effort to cut them off from being a nation. And that's still going on today. As you study Psalm 83 and as you read Psalm 83, you'll see that ongoing conflict. Now, we really won't have time to talk much about Psalm 83 other than to point this out as part of what goes on to try to eliminate Israel. And I think this psalm is being fulfilled in all the things we see today from the neighbors around them. But look at verse 8. There's an astounding statement in verse 8 that after all this says, Assyria also is joined with them. Why would this scripture be there? Why would this point out that Assyria also joined with them? Who is Assyria that's being pointed out here? I would suggest to you that we get our answer from the book of Ezra. Ezra, remember, is prophesying and he's recording the history of the restoration of Israel when it's moving back from Babylon. In Ezra 6.22, we read that uh, they kept the Feast of Unleavened Bread with joy because the Lord had made them joyful and turned the heart of the king of, Is of Assyria unto them. That was to, it was uh, Darius the Mede that reiterated the order of Cyrus, which was given in, in Ezra 6.1. And note in verses 12 to 13, it's identified, uh, Darius identifies himself as making the decree. At that time, he was the king of Persia. The king of Persia was called the king of Assyria, as we have referenced by Ezra, and that was common as we read in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. So I think it means that Persia today, of course, is Iran, one of those very nations that we saw in this conflict. So somewhere, why are they mentioned separately? Because they're not really part of that Arab group. You know, they are Persians and, and uh, affiliated with them, but there's a leading effort by the Assyrian to come into their land. I think Iran plays a very important part in the final days of this earth when God is going to fight for Israel. So think about Iran today. The U.S. has withdrawn its nuclear agreement, and this is going back and forth to what will happen, but the prospect of an Israeli-American strike uh, that would lead to war is very prominent. But recently, Iran and Syria, just two months ago, signed an agreement for military cooperation. I think it's Syria directly to the north where there's so many threats going on for cooperation and reconstruction of that nation of Syria that's been torn apart by war. The Iranian defense minister says the axis of resistance, which is Iran, Syria, and Hezbollah, is prepared and ready to respond to any attack against Syria. Iran is playing a very important part in establishing itself as an enemy against Israel. And Syria has gone through increasing airstrikes as there's threats coming into Israel. And Iran's presence is pushing this civil war that has been there and armed up uh, in new directions as the Syrian uh, civil war declines. Lebanon certainly has offered, has a lot of self-confidence that's gained from the four years of fighting that Hezbollah did. They've got capabilities now to maneuver into enemy territory as they did during the Syrian civil war, and they're drafting large forces in rapid speed and more. 
Israel recently described the uh, Lebanese army, which is Hezbollah, as the strongest army in the Middle East after the IDF. Their weapons now, night devices, electronic combat, hundreds of drones, they're not fighting on the ground anymore, mortars carrying explosives, heavy rockets, all these things building to the north of Israel. Well, Zechariah points us to what's going to happen there. And let's look, take a quick look at that as we build up the forces that are setting up for a final, I believe, battle against their neighbors around them. Zechariah 10.6 from the Jewish Bible says, I will strengthen the house of Yehuda, save the house of Yosef. That's uh, Judah and Joseph. Bring them back in my compassion. They will be as if I hadn't driven them out. Zechariah 10 tells us, God says, I will bring them back from Egypt. I will gather them from Assyria, and I will bring them to Gilead. Now, from Egypt, in 1948, 100,000 Jews left Egypt to go back into uh, to Israel. Assyria, from Iran, 100,000 in 1979 with the revolution there, went back to Israel. Where does God say he would bring them? To Gilead, which is northwest Jordan, and Lebanon, he says. This is Isaiah 11:14. Some point, at some point, there will be some kind of a settlement or some kind of a conflict between Jordan and Lebanon and Israel because that's the place where God said he's going to bring back uh, those that are, uh, are, are still away from Israel. A huge migration there. I personally believe that's going to take place before the time of the, the, the final time of the end. But look at what's happened with the population of Israel. Here they are. From, from, you can see from 1940 on, but almost a straight line up. And most of those have been a Jewish population right through today. We can take a quick look at Israel compared to its neighbors, now at 8.5 million, dwarfed by those. And think about those two places I mentioned, Lebanon and Syria. Of course, Syria lost over 4 million people in this war. But notice even with Iran, Iran has 82 million people. Now that force against Israel is pretty overwhelming. So we'll see what happens. Israel is yet, I believe, to possess all the land as we have described here. That Lebanon, that part of uh, Syria. Zechariah says that there would be no place for them, but they'd be brought back into Gilead and Lebanon. So I think the first attack against Israel at the end of this age will be this invasion of hostile Arab neighbors. Maybe over the land of Jerusalem, who knows. But the battle of the, with the Arabs, I think, is resolved prior to the gathering of nations in that theme scripture I gave you. Because, remember I mentioned Iran, I believe, is Assyria. Notice what Micah 5.5 5 says. This manner shall be the peace. This will be peace in Israel. When the Assyrians shall come into our land, then we shall raise against them seven shepherds and eight princes of men. We know the seven shepherds is suggested in some of the commentary as representing the completed church. The eight princes of men, the ancient worthies. Who is the most likely people to resolve the conflict between Israel and its neighbors? Isn't it a common ancestor? Think of Moses. Or Abraham gets up and says, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. No more fighting here. Well, just a suggestion. Whoops, sorry. So back to that theme text in our last few remaining minutes. That theme text says in Joel that God calls the nations to assemble themselves to come the heathen, and to gather themselves together to the valley of Jehoshaphat. That in Israel is a place where God will finally reveal himself to the world and to the nations. But I think it comes after that resolution of the Arab-Israeli conflict finally in whatever manner that takes place. 
And that's when the alliance of Gog and Magog says, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages to them that are at rest, dwell safely. That's what invites that last great conflict against Israel, because now it's seen that they're there. And who leads with them? I think the Assyrian still is gaining with them. And remember, if that represents Iran, they're not part of that neighborhood. Now, it's important to realize Ezekiel 38 tells us that it doesn't happen quickly. We see here in the latter years, they're, when they're brought back from the sword, they'll dwell securely, all of them. And I would suggest for a list of the nations mentioned in Ezekiel 38, you look at their footnotes in the revised version, improved and corrected on Genesis 10, where these nations are listed and their ancestors. Ezekiel 38, 8, I believe, indicates a long period of preparation in this. Uh, King James says, after many days, this will happen. Rotherham says, after many days, the forces are mustered against Israel. The Septuagint says, he'll be prepared after many days and shall come at the end of years. So it's no surprise that we're going on and on and on with this conflict. It will last until God is ready to intervene. And remember when that intervention comes, we have to have the completed church and the ancient worthies on the scene. So it means a lot, brethren, for you and I. Let's look at what the conclusion is about that. After the regathering of Israel pictured in Ezekiel 37, the dry bones, then we have the resolution of this Arab-Israeli conflict, finally followed by the battle in the Valley of Jehoshaphat that we refer to as Armageddon. And it's there that God reveals himself. That's then followed in Ezekiel in the next few chapters, 40 through 48, 46 through 48, by the vision of Ezekiel's temple. It's that temple that represents the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Christ that will follow. So it's a miraculous series of events that takes place. But remember, the ultimate outcome is for God to reveal himself in the establishment of his kingdom and his rule. And it will be that kingdom that will be the first real opportunity, I think, for Israel to bless the people of the world. Well, there are many who say Israel's blessing the world today with all their inventions and things. They're making a huge contribution, which I wish we had time to look at where they are today relative to the world. But that's not what's being talked about. The blessing that will come will be because they have known over the years to know almost every culture and climate on earth in the scattering that's been there. But first, they must go through this redemption that comes, I believe, in the resolution of this conflict between them and their neighbors. So brethren, let's be faithful. We are Christians in training to be a holy priesthood in that age, in that coming time. Peter tells us that. We must learn now how to demonstrate a willingness to love and bless all. And it's a challenge in an environment like we are today. Can you truly say you love those enemies who are battling against us so fiercely? But that's what we must do. 